Well, we've come to the end of Unit 3. This has been a long unit, but it's been a very important unit. What I'd like to do now is to just very quickly recap some of the key takeaways that uh, you should leave this unit with. So Unit 3 was all about electrostatics, getting ready to move on to Unit 4, where we'll talk about transport. We began the unit by understanding qualitatively the MOS electrostatics in one dimension by drawing energy band diagrams. And we saw that everything that happens in the semiconductor with respect to how much charge, both depletion charge and mobile charge, all depends on the surface potential. So we learned how to interpret energy band diagrams in terms of that surface potential. And we developed quickly a qualitative understanding of how the charge versus surface potential would look. In the accumulation region, everything piled up exponentially, holes at the interface. Uh, depletion region, we pushed mobile carriers away from the surface and uncovered depleted charge. And then when we inverted, uh, the potential began to increase rapidly again. Uh, we couldn't explain the numerical aspects of this yet, why it happened exponentially or as the square root of uh, potential, but we did that later on in the unit. First thing we did was to solve the Poisson equation in the depletion region. When we have applied a positive voltage to the gate, pushed the mobile carriers away, but we have not yet created an inversion layer. We solved the Poisson equation. Divergence D is equal to rho. The only charge was due to the ionized acceptors. So we had a very simple electric field versus position line. I went high value at the surface, zero value at the edge of this depletion region, and we could take that simple understanding and develop some very important depletion approximation expressions for the depletion depth, W sub D, the electric field at the surface, E sub S, and the total charge per square centimeter in the depletion region, Q sub D. So those are expressions that we used frequently. So everything depends in the semiconductor on the surface potential, but it's the gate voltage that determines the surface potential. So we went on to connect the gate voltage to the surface potential, and Kirchhoff's ver uh, voltage law simply says that the voltages have to add up. The voltage on the gate is the sum of the voltage drop across the oxide plus the voltage drop across the semiconductor. Uh, we worked through the electrostatics, and we saw that the voltage on the gate was minus the charge in the semiconductor divided by the capacitance of the oxide per square centimeter uh, plus the voltage drop across the semiconductor, which was the surface potential. Okay, now we also developed, in addition to this exact representation, uh, which can sometimes be cumbersome to apply, an approximate way to relate the gate voltage to the surface potential, thinking about the MOS system as two capacitors in series, one representing the oxide capacitance itself, a second representing the capacitance of the semiconductor layer, which depends on the surface uh, potential. So it is a nonlinear uh, voltage dependent capacitor, which would make things complicated. But if we simply take an average value, then life becomes simple. And we showed that the surface potential is gate voltage divided by a numerical factor M, the numerical factor M is 1 plus the semiconductor capacitance divided by the, the, by the uh, oxide capacitance. Uh, we normally use this approximation in the depletion region, in the depletion region, where the semiconductor capacitance is the depletion capacitance. And in that region, M is a little bit bigger than 1, typically. So then we could understand how, when we increase the gate voltage, we increase the band bending in the semiconductor. So there is a region in subthreshold where a change in gate voltage produces a large change in surface potential. But once we exceed the uh, threshold voltage, then it becomes very difficult to change the surface potential with additional increases in gate voltage. Um, that happens at this critical band bending of 2 psi b, which is an important parameter that appears over and over again in these kinds of MOS analyses. Uh, the gate voltage it takes to produce 2 psi b is what we call the threshold voltage. And we developed a simple expression for the threshold voltage. 
Remember here, when you see a prime on a voltage, it means it's with the ideal structure that assumes no metal semiconductor work function difference and no charge at the oxide silicon interface. We went on to talk about the consequences of a metal semiconductor work function difference, and we explained how a built-in voltage has to happen. In the case I'm illustrating here, there is a built-in positive voltage on the gate even before we apply a voltage to the gate. That positive voltage induces a positive surface potential, bends the band down, uh, surface a, a uh, additional uh, band bending also occurs when we introduce a sheet charge uh, at the oxide silicon interface. And we saw that it's easy to account for those two factors simply by accounting for the fact that the flat band voltage is no longer at zero gate voltage, but it is at some finite gate voltage, which depends on the metal semiconductor work function difference and the amount of charge at the oxide silicon interface. So the ideal structure is easy to analyze. We simply add the flat band voltage to the ideal structure and we describe realistic structures. It just translates the characteristics to the left or right. We talked briefly also about MOS capacitance because it's a widely used diagnostic tool for understanding MOS systems. And the idea there is that we have a DC voltage that bends the bands up or down and then we superimpose on that DC voltage a small signal AC voltage and then we can deduce from those measurements the capacitance of this structure and that capacitance can tell us quite a lot about what's going on inside the system. So the DC bias simply establishes one of these band bending uh, situations and then on top of that DC bias we have a small signal AC bias that allows us to evaluate the capacitance once we're biased in one of these regions. We saw that we can understand the MOS capacitance. It's high in the accumulation regime. It drops in the depletion region. And under high frequencies, it saturates at a lower value in the inversion region. Real structures are simply going to be translated to the left because in a p-type sample, the flat band voltage tends to be negative. We understood the high capacitance in the accumulation region by thinking of a sheet of charge on the metal plate, which is at the top of the insulator, and a sheet of charge in the insulator, which represents the mobile holes piling up in the accumulation layer right below the oxide layer. In the depletion layer, it's like we have two dielectrics between two metallic plates. One metallic plate is the gate electrode itself. Uh, the insulator layer is the oxide. The second insulator layer is the depleted semiconductor layer. And then there's a moderately or heavily doped silicon layer that effectively acts as a second metal plate. We now have two capacitors in series. We have a lower capacitance. As we increase the gate bias, we push the depletion region deeper and deeper. We make the capacitance smaller and smaller until we increase the, the bias to a point where we invert the surface. We can't push the depletion region any deeper. The capacitance under high frequencies saturates at a low value. Um, you might initially think that, well, I have this strong inversion layer right below the insulator. Doesn't that act as a metallic plate and send the capacitance up again? Well, it does if the frequency is low enough um, so that the inversion layers can follow this rapidly varying AC signal. But if the frequency is too high, the small signal doesn't even know there's any charge in the inversion layer. It doesn't respond to the small signal. So we measure only the depletion charge. Okay, so that's the high frequency characteristics. Under low frequencies, when the inversion layer can follow it, we would measure the oxide capacitance again. In an MOS capacitor, we would have to go to very low frequencies for that to happen. But in an MOS transistor, if we've got a large transistor with a large gate so that we can easily measure the capacitance, we have a supply of electrons in the source and the drain that can quickly move in and out and help the inversion layer follow a high frequency AC signal. So we would measure the low frequency characteristic in high frequencies if we're doing this measurement on an actual MOS transistor. Okay, then we moved our attention to the mobile charge itself, because it's the mobile charge that gives us the current in a MOSFET. And we developed an understanding 
for the total mobile charge in coulombs per square centimeter by integrating the mobile electron density into the depth of the semiconductor so that we got all of the charge, which can, you know, all of the charge, the charge right at the surface, but the charge just below the surface also contributes to the current. We know that the electron densities vary exponentially as we change the separation between the conduction band and the Fermi level. So we expect this mobile charge to vary exponentially as well. Well, we went through some analysis, and uh, I won't repeat it here, but we saw that below threshold, there is mobile charge. It doesn't affect the electrostatics, but it carries all of the subthreshold current, and it varies exponentially with surface potential, just as we would have guessed. Above threshold, the situation is just a little more complicated. It varies, the mobile charge varies exponentially with surface potential, but there is a factor of two that comes in in the denominator of that. Uh, expression. For the fully depleted ultra-thin body structure, it's even simpler. The mobile charge varies exponentially with surface potential, both in subthreshold and then above threshold, just as it does in the bulk, but there is no change in the slope above threshold. We then shifted our attention to what gate voltage produces this mobile charge, because it's the gate voltage that we have actually have access to. And we were able to show that in both the bulk and the fully depleted uh, ultra-thin body characteristics, the subthreshold uh, mobile charge varies exponentially with gate voltage. It's important to remember that for the ultra-thin body, it varies exponentially as Q to the VGS minus VT over 1 kT. And in the Bulk structure, it varies as e to the q VGS minus VT over mKT, where m is a factor that is greater than or equal to 1. We work very hard to make it as close to 1 as possible, but an advantage of the fully depleted ultra-thin body is that it is always 1. Above threshold, both of these structures uh, display a linear variation of mobile charge versus gate voltage in excess of the threshold voltage. Then we moved on to two-dimensional electrostatics. Properly treating two-dimensional electrostatics involves typically numerically solving a two-dimensional Poisson equation. Uh, that tends to be difficult and tedious. Uh, even if you're going to do that, you want to develop a qualitative understanding of what you see in those characteristics and what they do to transistors. So we argued that two-dimensional electrostatics are responsible for the dibble that we understand from the terminal characteristics. They're responsible for the fact that the threshold voltage decreases as the drain voltage increases. They're responsible for the fact that the threshold voltage decreases as the channel length decreases. And they're responsible for the fact that the dibble increases as the channel length decreases. Uh, two, when two-dimensional electrostatic effects become even stronger, then we see that we may not only get increased dibble, we may also get increased subthreshold swing, which is not a desirable characteristic to have in a transistor. Um, that subthreshold swing may also increase not only with drain voltage, but also as the channel length decreases. Both of them are allowing the electric field from the drain to have an influence near the source end of the channel on that energy barrier. And finally, if these effects get very severe, we say that the device is punched through. The gate loses most or all of its control over the current. Current always flows. We can't con turn the device on and off with a gate uh, voltage anymore. We really don't have a useful device if it's punched through. And the final way that 2D electrostatics comes into effect is that it affects the slope of the IV characteristic in the output regime. The stronger the two-dimensional effects are, the higher this slope is, the output resistance gets smaller as the channel length decreases because of these effects, and that's an undesirable effect, especially for analog circuits. Uh, we talked about how we understand these effects, these effects that we observe in the terminal IV measurements. We talked about how we understand them. Uh, it, the barrier lowering point of view helps us explain a significant number of them. The fact that the potential at the drain reaches through and pulls down the barrier increases the leakage current. It lowers the threshold voltage because it means we need to push the barrier down less in order to get the same on current. 
So that barrier lowering view helps us understand some of the things we see in the IV characteristics. Okay. Now, what the device designer wants to do is to control these two-dimensional electrostatic effects so that they have small influences on transistor performance. And one of the key ways to do that is through geometric screening, trying to design a transistor structure in such a way that the electric field lines that emanate from the positively, uh, the positive voltage on the drain terminal terminate in the neutral semiconductor or on the metallic plate before they reach due to the source and begin to lower the barrier and pull electrons out of the source. We don't want that to happen. This is characterized in terms of a geometric screening length, which is basically the distance over which the electric fields from the drain penetrate towards the channel. And the goal is to minimize that, to make that geometric screening length small compared to the length of the channel. Then we have an electrostatically well-behaved MOSFET. So these uh, uh, effects became harder and harder to manage in planar MOSFETs. So not too long ago, the industry began to switch towards FinFETs. A FinFET is a structure that allows you to rapagate around the, the side, top, and other side of a silicon fin. Wrapping the gate around that way reduces the geometric screening length and helps improve the uh, the suppression of 2D electrostatics and helps device designers move to shorter channel lengths and maintain good IV characteristics. So putting all of this together, we have an understanding of what makes a, an electrostatically well-designed MOSFET. It is one in which at the top of the barrier between the source and the channel, we have a very simple expression between charge and gate voltage that is essentially the expression that comes from our 1D treatment with a small modification due to a small amount of dibble that makes the, the threshold voltage, drain voltage dependent. It is a transistor in which the geometric screening length is managed so that there is a region near the source that is under the strong control of the gate potential and only very weakly influenced by the drain potential. And that means that as we continue to increase the drain bias in the saturation region, most of the additional voltage drop occurs near the drain end of the channel with very little of it occurring near the source end and lowering the barrier. If we've achieved that, we've achieved what we would call a well-tempered, electrostatically well-designed MOSFET. So finally, we were able to put all of this understanding together to revisit our simple level zero virtual source model and do a significantly improved description of the mobile charge in that model so that we took the level one, uh, the level zero model, converted it to a level one model. We now have a model that smoothly treats the IV characteristics from subthreshold to above threshold, from linear to saturation. And it's a relatively simple model with a small number of parameters that are mostly physical based, we've now had to introduce two empirical parameters to do better fits to the experimental data or their you know, well understood parameters and the parameter alpha that we introduced here does a better job of fitting the numerical solution to the electrostatics as we move from subthreshold to above threshold. We briefly talked about the subthreshold swing, which we can now evaluate with our virtual source model. And we saw that we can evaluate the subthreshold swing and that it's given by 2.3 m times kT over q. The best that m can be is one, and that leads to a subthreshold swing that can be no smaller than 60 millivolts per decade. And unfortunately, that's a real limitation for technologists these days. We would like to find a transistor that has a subthreshold swing less than 60 millivolts per decade. And that involves moving to some different physics for, for uh, transistor operation. Okay, so it, we're ready now that we have a good solid understanding of charge in this current expression to move on to unit four. And we'll find that uh, we can easily now understand transport at the nanoscale and make physical sense out of what those two parameters in our model, mobility and saturation velocity, which had a nice, clear physical reason in long channel MOSFETs, we'll see that they also have a nice, clear 
physical reason in short channel MOSFETs as well. That'll be the topic of Unit 4.